Greetings, everyone. This is Fred Coulter. Welcome to Church at Home. Church at Home is dedicated to restoring original Christianity for today. What did the apostles teach? What did Jesus teach? And why is it that the establishment religions that are called Christian in this world virtually have nothing to do with what was originally taught? Now, in the last segment, we covered repent, godly repentance, and be baptized. We'll get to baptism in a little bit. But why repent? Why does God require that? And what is repentance all about anyway? What are you repenting of? Well, you're repenting of sin. So you might ask the question, what is sin? Well, what does the Bible teach us that sin is? 1 John 3, 4, sin is the transgression of the law. Now, transgression means a breaking or going against law. That is, the laws of God. Now, the original Greek is sin is lawlessness. Now, lawlessness comes in many forms. Neglect of law, rejecting law, being anti-law against the laws of God by having traditions and teachings of men instead. All of that is sin. All of that is lawlessness. And this is what God requires when we repent. That's why we covered last time the Ten Commandments, because without law, there is no sin. But there is law, and there's one lawgiver who is God, and he requires us to keep his laws. Now then, since we all sin and come short of the glory of God, and we find that twice in the book of Romans, what is the deep, profound result of godly repentance. Let's come to Psalm 51. Now, Psalm 51 is a very interesting and profound psalm from this point of view. This is a psalm of David and his repentance after the affair with Bathsheba. Now, the affair with Bathsheba was not a one-time event. And there was a lot involved in it because Bathsheba was involved and David was involved because he would go out on the top of the roof of his palace and right below was where Bathsheba would go out and take her evening bath. So guess what happened? David is king, sent a messenger to her, to come over to the palace. Now think about the choices involved in this. David did not have to do that, and she did not have to come. But they did, and they had an affair. And guess what happened? Bathsheba got pregnant. Now here's a king God put on the throne, one that loved God, one that God loved. And this was a terrible, absolute, wretched sin and crime because not only was there that affair, but her husband, Uriah the Hittite, was one of the officers in part of David's army. And they were out fighting a battle. And so David called Joab the general in and said, now, when the battle gets intense, back off from Uriah, and let the enemy kill him. Now look at all the intrigue. Look at all the sinful thoughts. Look at all that went on with this. And remember this, as we ended last time, Job said, no thought can be withheld from you, O God. Now, David didn't repent right away. He had to send Nathan the prophet. 
And Nathan the prophet came and said to him, There was a rich man who had everything, but he took a poor man's ewe for himself. And David got angry and said, Who is that man? And Nathan looked right at him and said, You are that man because of the sin with Bathsheba and murdering her husband. You are that man. Well, David repented. So here in Psalm 51, we have this prayer of repentance. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion. Blot out my transgression. Now that has to be deep, profound, utter repentance and complete admission of sins in your life, just like it is here. Now, there are a lot of things in this psalm which tells us about godly repentance. So, if you want to come to God, and if you want to be in right standing with God, you must repent. And we will see that there is a profound lesson in repentance. Verse 2, Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. And isn't that the way it is? When you get caught in sin, just like David did here, it's ever before you. Now you stop and think about your life. What sins have you committed and done? Now remember what human nature is like. Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things. Now that's a heart of every human being. Who can know it? See, the truth is, sin is so devious within us that you can't even know when you are sinning unless you understand the commandments of God. Because everyone has a standard of right and wrong in their own mind, but that's not the standard of God. So let's see what else David said here. Against you, you only have I sinned and done evil in your sight. Now, remember the Ten Commandments. We went through them. And if not, then you go to Exodus 20 or Deuteronomy 5, and there are the Ten Commandments. And you ask yourself the question, am I keeping these commandments? Let's take it one step further. Jesus said, the greatest commandment is to love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and being and to love your neighbor as yourself. And on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophet. And guess what, folks? That's New Testament doctrine. And so is transgressing the law, because it puts you in lawlessness. And isn't that what ended up with David in this case? How about your life? What sins do you have? What commandments do you break? How often do you tell lies? How often do you tell lies to yourself? And those are the worst lies. If you believe the lies you tell to yourself, you're really deceived. So that's why we have church at home, to preach the Word of God, to lay things out the way the Bible shows us, the way God sees things. Now, God is willing to forgive. He's ready to forgive. He's waiting to forgive. But there's no forgiveness without repentance. So let's go on. Against you, you only have I sinned and done evil in your sight, that you might be justified when you speak and be in the right when you judge. Now, we'll talk about judgment a little bit later here, because in all of this, establishment Christianity 
has so far removed itself from God that they don't really understand what sin is, and they have a false Jesus and false doctrine, see? So you need to really think about that. And you can say, well, how can that be? Very simple. When you start going against God, you keep on doing it. Well, how did that begin with Christianity of this world? When they decided that they were so good and so righteous that they didn't have to keep the Sabbath, the fourth commandment, which is from Friday sundown to Saturday sundown, the commandment of God, and know this, that's the very first commandment that we find in Genesis, the second chapter. And God made holy that day. But men come along and say, oh, we're greater than God. Well, they don't phrase it like that. They justify it by saying, well, that's for the Jews. No, was Adam a Jew? Pray tell if you believe that. You are deceived. Many Bible believers today have followed tradition handed down by previous generations. They believe and were taught that Sunday is the proper day of worship. That the Savior changed the day of worship from the Sabbath to Sunday. The adoption of Sunday as the Christian Sabbath has little to do with the Bible and everything to do with Constantine the Great over 300 years after the Messiah's death. Constantine was emperor of the Roman Empire from 306 to 337 CE. He was a sun worshiper who on his deathbed converted to Christianity. In 321 CE, while still a sun worshiper, Constantine established Sunday as the day of worship. He decreed, On the venerable day of the sun, let the magistrates and people residing in cities rest, and let all workshops be closed. In this coin circulated by Constantine in 317 CE, we see the face of Constantine on one side, and on the other the figure of Sol Invictus, the unconquered sun. The sun god was also known as Mithras, and his birth was on December 25th. This date was adopted as the birth of Christ and became the date for Christmas many centuries later. Clearly Constantine was an avid worshiper of the sun god Sol Invictus. Amazingly, Martin Luther, the champion of the modern-day Protestant movement, said, They allege that the Sabbath changed into Sunday, the Lord's Day, contrary to the Decalogue as it appears. Neither is there any example more boasted of than the changing of the Sabbath day. Great, say they, is the power and authority of the church since it dispensed with one of the Ten Commandments. So then, in verse 5, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. That doesn't mean she had an adulterous affair. It just means this. All human beings are born with human nature, and the law of sin and death inherently within them. It's automatic. It's genetic. And that's what God is asking you to repent over and to change the way that you are living in exchange for forgiveness of your sins. And then, as we will see in the next segment, with baptism, you're looking forward to eternal life. Here's the whole purpose of godly repentance. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you shall make me to know wisdom. He wants the truth in here, okay? In your heart, in your mind, and we'll have some studies on what is truth. It may not be exactly what you think. Purge me with isop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Today, that's with the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Verse 9, hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. 
Now, verse 10. Verse 10 is the whole process of conversion. And it's deep within, and it involves your heart, and your mind, and your thoughts, and everything that is the inward part that makes you who you are. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Now notice how close David was to committing the unpardonable sin. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Very interesting indeed, isn't it? Now, let's come to the book of Romans. Book of Romans is quite a book, and it tells all the basics about human nature, repentance, and all the things that we need to do. Now, if sin is the transgression of the law, which it is, if sin is lawlessness, which it is, then lawfulness is keeping the commandments of God. And God is the lawgiver. Now, not many people know that. And if you go to a Protestant minister and say, we ought to keep the commandments, he'll say, well, you're trying to earn your salvation. Not so. Let's look at the phrase, under the law. Now, we'll see a little later, Paul talks about within law. Two different things. Let's come to Romans 7 and verse 1. And here's a great principle that you need to understand and applies to every human being in the world. Because Paul also wrote that in God who made the heavens and earth. In him, we live and move and have our being. Every human being on earth. God gave them life, choice, and everything that there is, and gave the world to all of mankind. So think about what a tremendous gift that was. Romans 7 and verse 1. Are you ignorant, brethren? Let me ask you a question. Are you ignorant of what God says? And maybe you may know a little bit about it, but how much do you know? And if you don't know, you're like this. You're ignorant. And here's one of the most profound things to understand. For I'm speaking to those who know law, who know the whole purpose of law, the commandments of God, the laws of nature, and all of that sort of thing. That, the law. Now, that means the laws of God. The law. That's all the laws of God. That's all the Ten Commandments of God. And all of them as they apply in the Spirit. That, the law, rules over a man for as long a time as he may live. So let me ask you a question. If the law rules over you, guess what? You're under law, aren't you? And it shows as long a time as he may live, from his first breath to his last breath. No escaping of it. God made it that way. Now let's see this verified back here in Romans, the third chapter and verse 19. After showing all of the ways that men are today, and today, Everybody is sinning, openly, wantonly, pervertedly. My life is the church. My life is being a pastor. And so the struggle in some ways was more external. Sometimes even now I, I hear things or see things online or um, from a friend or something commenting on you can't be gay and you in Christian at the same time. And then really that was more externally imposed on me 
because so much of who Erica is, so much of who I know myself to be, is a pastor. There are lots of parts of my identity, um, being gay and being Christian, those are both in there with lots of other things too. So to take away one of those cores didn't feel like an option to me. It was more of a process of seeing how they could or could not work together and, and dealing with that more. I take some comfort in seeing Jesus being multiple identities simultaneously. That doesn't mean that all of them are being shown all the time. I'm still, I'm still sorting through which parts of me to be at what time. I'm never not a pastor. I'm never not gay. I'm never not a woman or a budding home cook or a Texan, and the list goes on. But which of those parts of myself am I tapping into at the moment? And I'm still, I'm still learning that. A lot of, I think, well-meaning people open the Bible and say, I don't see any LGBTQ people spoken of positively here. How, how can you be this and Christian? But there are wisdoms and truths and passages, not just verses, to pull from. So when I say that I've come to an accepting and affirming place for myself and for LGBTQ people, this is not outside the Bible. This is partly inside the Bible. Uh, and it's not just the passages about love. It is passages about sexuality. I turn to Song of Solomon and see beauty. I turn to Psalms. I turn to the wisdom uh, literature of the Hebrew Bible. Yes, I turn to the Gospels and how Jesus responded to people. But to come to an affirming place, accepting myself as a woman and as a pastor and as a gay person is not outside the Bible. It's inside the Bible in the ways that uh, I know that God loves me, for the Bible tells me so. Verse 19, now then we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under law, so that every mouth may be stopped. You're not going to go to God and tell him anything. Maybe stop. Now notice, and all the world may become guilty before God. Because, verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's you, that's me, that's every human being on earth. This is why Christ came to be the offering the sin offering, so we can receive forgiveness. But forgiveness is a beginning. Forgiveness is not an end into itself. Now that's something you'll have to learn as we go along. Now then, let's talk a little bit more about law. Because this is important. Let's come to Matthew 5, 17. Now, we've covered this before, but in the context of what we're talking about now, this becomes absolutely imperative for you to know and to understand. Now, there's one lawgiver, and that lawgiver is God. And the laws and commandments of God cannot be done away because they are eternal, and they are perfect. Psalm 19 says, the law of the Lord is perfect. Now, don't you want to follow something that is perfect? But of course you do. But religionists say, Jesus came to do away with the law. That, my friend, is not true. He never did. Come down here to verse 17, Matthew 5. The very words of Jesus, right at the beginning of his ministry. He didn't come and say, I'm here to do away with the law so all of you can live any way you want to and God still loves you. Verse 17, Do not think that I, Jesus, 
have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. Now, what does fulfill mean? To make complete. The law is raised to a higher spiritual standard, not done away. And the prophecies, all of the prophecies pertaining to Jesus, were fulfilled concerning his life, his death, his resurrection. For truly, that means in truth, I say to you, until heaven and earth shall pass away. Well, heaven and earth is still here, isn't it? Last time I checked. Last time you checked, it's still here, right? Now notice what he says. One jot or one tittle shall in no way pass from the law until everything has been fulfilled. That's the whole plan of God, which is fantastic indeed. Do you know the plan of God? You want to know the plan of God? Well, we've got a nice book for you. God's Sabbath and Holy Days Reveal the Plan of God. Have you ever heard of that? Probably not. And that's why you don't know the plan of God. But He has revealed it in His Word, and His Word is always true, and He does not lie. Now, notice what he says here in verse 19, because this is important. Since all the establishment religious leaders break the laws of God, teach against the laws of God, reject the laws of God, and say everybody has grace. Now, we'll find out what grace is about here in a little bit. Therefore, Whoever shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men to do so. Now think about that for a minute. You've gone to a church and they say, well, we don't keep the Sabbath anymore, but that's all right. We keep Sunday. Uh Uh-huh. Shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven does not even say they will attain to it. But whoever shall practice and teach them This one shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now think about that for a minute. That's why there's repentance, and repentance means stop sinning and start obeying God, and that you have to have a profound, deep repentance that is moving to great sorrow over your sins, because your sins, you, with your name, have killed Christ. You want the sacrifice of Christ applied to you? Then you have to admit your sins were part of his death. And you have chosen to do that because you have chosen to live your life apart from God, and you're suffering the results of it, and you're suffering the sorrow of it, and you're suffering the confusion of it. That's why you need to turn to God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your being. So this is why repentance is required. And then we will see, after repentance, baptism is required. It's an amazing combination that you need to know. So once again, thank you for inviting us into your home. You write for our booklet, Lord, What Should I Do? And that brings out about repentance that you need to really understand so that you can draw close to God and God will draw close to you. So this is Fred Coulter saying until next time, so long everyone. <laughs>